Good morning. It is another video from Professor Grenfell's lecture series, Math 12 Statistics. And here we are in Chapter 5, Section 2. We're discussing mean, variance, standard deviation, and the expected value for a probability distribution. We are not able to compute these values, the mean, variance, standard deviation, nor the expected value. For a probability distribution directly. Why not? Well, because we cannot perform this experiment an infinite number of times. So in order to get the true value, we would have to continue performing this experiment, and keep, keep, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> flipping, flipping a coin, an infinite number of times. And we, we simply cannot do that. So what we are going to be doing is we're going to be making that mathematical assumption that we are going to be repeating this an infinite number of times, and then from there deriving a calculation that would give us the theoretical value of the mean, for instance, if we were able to uh, continue the experiment an infinite number of times, which, which we can't do. So here we, we have developed some fancy, for lack of a better term, fancy mathematics and um, develop these, these formula that we are going to be seeing. For the first value, the mean of the probability distribution, we're going to be taking each outcome times its probability, and then taking the sum over all possible outcomes in our sample space. That's exactly what it says here. We have each outcome times its respective probability. And then we are taking the sum over all potential outcomes from our sample states. So to just break this down, what this means is you take the first x value times the probability for that first x value, and then Take the second x value is x subscript 2 times the probability of x subscript 2. And we're adding these all up. After you do these multiplications, you're going to just keep adding up terms of that same form. So dot, dot, dot. Plus, then you do this all the way up to x subscript n times the probability of x subscript n. And so here, x sub 1 all through x sub n, all of these are all of the different potential outcomes. And so therefore, we're going through all n of these. And n is the number of different outcomes that we have in our sample space. So again, that is the summation of x times p of x. And now would be a great time to remind you that we do the multiplications first. We do x times its probability, p of x. And we do these first. So we're going to have one column with x times whatever its probability is, the outcome value times the probability of that outcome happening, and then add up that whole column. So Notice in the book, they don't use parentheses around the x and the p of x. So they just write the sum of x times p of x. So remember, you have to do these multiplications first and then add it all up. OK, so this is a quick example. They explain this. It's not a numbered example in the book. But let's suppose we flip two coins. And let's have x be the number of heads that land uh, head side up, the number of uh, heads that we have on the coin. So the sample space for this is going to be, well, there's four outcomes. Uh, we could have the first coin heads and the second coin heads, the first coin heads and the second coin tails. Here 
you could flip the first coin tails and the second one heads or tails and tails. Let's quickly construct a probability distribution for this variable x. So the potential outcomes that we have for x are 2, 1, or 0. And so the classical or theoretical probability model says, well, there's only one instance in the sample space where you would flip two heads. So there's a total of four. So the, the probability of this would be one quarter. And similarly, we have one head occurring two out of the four times. So here, that reduces down to one half. And then last the probability of getting zero heads would be one quarter. Now, the rationale for why we would want to do x times p of x is as follows. So uh, if the likelihood of getting two heads is one quarter, then we would expect to see two heads one quarter of the time. Uh, here, similarly, if uh, we expect one head one half of the time and zero heads one quarter of the time, then the total number of heads that we expect to see would be the sum of all of these values. And so we multiply those out first and then add them all up and we get a total of one. Notice this is nice because this agrees with what our intuition tells us. If we flip two coins, well, half the time we're going to get exactly one head and one tail. And then one quarter of the time we won't get any heads. The other quarter of the time we'll get two heads. So it'll sort of balance out. If you were able to keep doing this, flipping two coins, letting them drop, and looking at the results, if we were able to continue and do that an infinite number of times, we would, on average, have the, you know, when we recorded the number of heads each individual time we performed this, we would expect the average to be evening out to uh, one, one head per flip of two coins. So mu equals one. The average number of heads that we will get by flipping two coins is exactly theoretically calculated to be one. Example 5-5 from page 266 of the book says find the mean of the number of spots that appear when a die is tossed. So we're going to want roll one uh, six-sided die so, I, yeah, I'm always going to remind you that it's a six-sided die, so we, we can kind of assume that unless I tell you otherwise. So the number of spots on this are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we remember, well, let's go through. There's only 1, 1, 2, 3, and so on and so forth, and we're going to say they're equally likely to roll any one of them. So the probability for all of these would be 1 over 6. Next, we're going to go ahead and insert an extra column here for x times its respective probability, x times p of x, in other words. And just go ahead and fill in all of these values. And notice, I'm not going to simplify any of these fractions, because at the end of it all, we're going to total these up. So in other words, instead of the total, we could say the sum of x times p of x. And that would be what we get. Add it all up, we get 21 over 6, or 3 and a half, or if you like the decimal, 3.5. And that is our expression. That is how we calculate the mean, mu.
in this next example, 5-8. The theme is battery packages, and we're going to be using the information from example 5-3. It says find the mean of the number of batteries sold over the weekend at this convenience store, and it lists for us the probability distribution. So we had two packs, and they were 20% likely to be sold. Okay, we had four packs, six packs, eight packs, and these are their respective probabilities. Calculate the average mu. We're going to take the sum of the outcome times its probability and repeat that for all of the outcomes. So in this next column, we're going to do x times p of x. So we've done x times p of x for all of these, and now we can total it up. And that gives us exactly 4.56. So the average that we expect to see is 4.56. That would be the average size package of batteries that was sold over the weekend. So you can see that some of these values are not ones that are attainable. It's impossible to roll a three and a half on the dice. It's, uh, it's you can't purchase uh, batteries in a 4.56 pack. So, uh, but these are over the long term. These are what the average would be projected to be if you could keep repeating this procedure indefinitely. This is the theoretical average for variance and standard deviation. We have yet another formula. So here it is. Sigma squared is equal to the summation of x minus mu, whole quantity squared, times the probability of x, where x is each individual outcome. We're taking each outcome minus whatever the theoretical average is, squaring that and then multiplying by the probability of that particular outcome, and then summing that up, doing that for every single outcome and adding them all up. And that's how we would get the variance. But then don't do, don't do it that way. Don't do this formula. Use instead the shortcut version. Sigma squared is equal to sum of x squared times the probability of x. And then once you've finished summing that whole thing up, then you subtract away mu squared. So it turns out this is algebraically equivalent to this one. But notice that since we don't have to keep subtracting the average every single time right there, for each and every data value, and then multiplying times the individual probability, and then adding all of those things up. Instead, we just do this procedure right here with the data values and their probabilities, and we leave the average out of it until the very end when we subtract it away. Or sorry, we subtract it squared away. In example 5-9, this is page 268, here is the probability distribution for, yes, you guessed it, rolling a single six-sided die. The outcomes are the values 1 through 6. The probabilities are all the same, They're all uniform, 1 out of 6. We're going to go ahead and introduce two extra columns. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and back this up, squeeze in an extra little column here for x squared, and then rewrite the x's over here. So the reason that I want the extra column for x squared is because not only do we have to have the sum of the x values squared, or sorry, the x values times the probability 
of x, but we also have to sum up x squared times p of x. So this is kind of cool. For the first row, 1 over 6 and 1 over 6. Second row, 2 over 6. And then x squared is 4 times 1 over 6. That would be 4 over 6. 3 over 6, 9 over 6 and so on. For this first column, sum this whole thing up, we get exactly 3.5. And what was this? This was the sum of the x values times their respective probabilities. So each x was the outcome. And remember, this is mu. That's the average. Next, we sum up this column here. 15.17, which is rounded to that, so that we don't lose information with our calculation. Why? Because this is the sum of x squared times p of x. And we're multiplying x squared times its respective probability for that outcome, and then we're summing all of those up. Why the heck are you doing that? That's a good question. Why am I doing this? Well, we're supposed to compute the variance and the standard deviation. So what is the formula for that first one? The variance is, what do we got to do? We got to sum up, oh, that's not how you write that. We got to sum up x squared times p of x. We'll do that full summation first, and then we'll subtract away p squared. And then to compute the standard deviation, sigma, well, don't repeat that whole thing. Just store it in your calculator's memory, and then plug it into the square root. Take the square root of it. The reason we're adding all of these up all of these up is because this is what the formula is telling us to do. It's saying add all of those up, add all of these ones up, and then afterwards square it, right? Because that mu was a sum. And so we substitute in 15.17. Actually, this was 15.166666 repeating, so I actually just kept that value in my calculator, and then told it to subtract 3.5 squared. And that gives me 2.917. It's actually 2.916666 repeating. So I mean, if we, if we rounded it off to this, and we plugged that back into our calculator without storing it in our calculator's memory, it would probably be OK. We'd, we'd get close enough, if not that exact chain value itself. So don't worry about it too much. And then we just go ahead and plug that into the square root. Just hit square root. And most, most, of, most scientific calculators would just punch the square root button next. And that gives us 1.708. I just want to jump back to one that we've already done before. So this is now 5-8. We're, we're now going to say, let's make it a different example, and let's find the variance and the standard deviation. So I'm going to go ahead and pop in an extra column here for x squared, start filling in those values so that we can go ahead and fill in those ones. And we sum those up, and we get 23.84. And then remember, we've already actually gone ahead and filled these all in. But if we hadn't, then we would simply compute the average right there. Sigma squared, our variance is going to be the sum of x squared times the probability of x. And then after we add all of that up, minus squared. And we're simply substituting in the sum of this column. This was, remember, 
x squared times p of x, 23.84. And then here, this was the average. This was the, well, it was the sum of x times p of x, but that's how we compute the average, 4.56. And then we square that. So here, notice we have to add this up before we square it, and we'll obtain the value 3.0.